Have you ever looked back at your childhood and wondered, "Geez, I used to love doing that, but it's been a while since I've done it." Well, today's guest understands you and hears you out because that's how she felt too. Meet Kimberly Wang. She is the founder, designer, operator at Q Kimber, a colorful fashion brand where she produces jewelry, clothes, and all sorts of accessories that gives you a little pop in positivity. I also have a handful of her items and absolutely love it. And what I'm inspired even more is not just her success as a fashion designer, but how she intertwined that skills with her unique business skills. You see, yes, she loved art growing up and had a quite a talent for it early on. I mean, even her teachers thought she was always going to have this art studio one day and work in this mega firm. And so it was disheartening when she, they learned that she wanted to pursue business, aka a career path a lot of Asian Americans want for their kids. <laughs> I mean, she also did well in academia as she looked back, but she also was just interested in other spaces. So she pursued business marketing at NYU, and you know, continue the career path of wanting to understand products and brands and all that jazz. But she still wanted to do something different. So she does something what not what most typical business grads would do. Went to Japan to teach English <laughs> for few years, and then she realized, well, maybe I can do this in China too and do something different. You're gonna quickly learn how the ten plus years she was in China, she ends up not only finding, paving her own career path in business, restaurant business in particular, interior design. Until she makes a full circle back to fashion, art, and her work as a fashion designer. So I'm excited for you to meet my friend Kimberly Wong. Meet Kim. So very excited to have my friend Kim here. Kim, welcome to the show. Very excited to have you as you as we celebrate AAPI Heritage Month.、Um, I mean, Asian American identity is everywhere. I know you've had been both a big advocate as well as an educator in that space, but also living through that dream yourself too. For most, I know. I guess first, welcome back to the states. I know it's been a few years, but I'm curious. You've one of the things that I want to first tackle is that you've lived in many different locations and countries. How has that experience perhaps? Changed or shaped how you think about your identity as an innovator, which we'll cover in all the different gamuts in our conversation.、Um, just want to say thank you first for Monica for having me、um, in the month of May. In terms of say like my own background, so I have lived、uh, the majority of my adult life in Asia.、Um, I was born and raised in the U.S. and recently, in the last two years, repatriated back. Um, what it means for me as an innovator is obviously I have to get used to a lot of unknowns like very quickly. Like I've dived into two different, completely different cultures、um, for both work and and just life, and you have to be open to embracing change and surprises all around. Thank you for sharing that, and we'll dive a little bit deeper into all your different chapters. But want to bring us back to. Down the memory lane of your childhood. Do you remember、um, as you were growing up? Where were you, and who you wanted to be, and what you wanted to do in the future? Well, actually, it's funny that you asked this question because I am sitting in my childhood bedroom right now. By the way, where I did grow up and have like these kinds of dreams. I grew up in a suburb of New Jersey. I wanted to be a Fashion designer, artist.、Um, when I was growing up, and yeah, kind of got there. <laughs> well, bring us in between because I know you jumped into also different careers and skills and experience you built. So before you became and jumped in back into fashion that you dreamed of doing when you were young, what are the other things that you have done that helped you? I guess hone your craft as an innovator. I have done like so many, so many different things. So a couple that just helped me along the way is one: I was a restaurateur when I lived in China. 
I also worked as a project director and operations for an interior design firm. And then I actually started my own fashion line. And I want to dive a little bit deeper into those previous chapters as well, because it's not often one for somebody to even start in one, let alone do all those different things. Tell me a little bit more of each of those different phases. And even like maybe in your times as a student, like what did you want to study? Did you study fashion then? So bring us there. When I was actually in school, like I always knew that I really, really loved art, but actually like I was also very well-rounded academically. I actually like applied and accepted and went to business school. And when I told my art teacher in high school, he was actually upset. And he was like, no, like you're meant to have this like huge like studio. Like, are you sure you want to do this? And that was a that was the only like reaction that I honestly remember. Like everybody else, of course, was like, congratulations. Like, you know, my family is very happy. The school is very highly ranked, like all of these things. You know, like a lot of my life, like younger was more about your parents have like a certain vision for you of wanting, say, like a stable future and like wanting you to have a very like high paying job. I think when I was younger, like I really felt pressured by that and and went towards that, knowing that I loved, you know, art all along. Was that also pressure that you felt from the culture and Asian American culture? Because I think often as we celebrate this month, one of the things we also want to bring to surface is sometimes also the challenges and just what the history brings into context. I'm curious what your upbringing was for you. Was it easy to bring out your interest in art or was there a reason why you felt like maybe I need to do business first? I think that growing up in a relatively like competitive um, suburb, whether they were people were Asian or not, actually, like it was just like academically competitive. You definitely felt like even though like you were really young, that like there was something that you had to like uphold kind of like a keeping of the Joneses. And so it was kind of like a, okay, well, is this part of, you know, having to like make my family happy and like to just like go do this and get this degree? Kind looking back, yeah, that's exactly what it was. Um, I'm sure many, many people have like done that. Where I maybe like veered a little bit off was definitely after I graduated, I just purposely chose like a different kind of like path where I could learn about who I was and like what I wanted and to actually go after my 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 true passions. And was it after business that you went to Asia to start your work? And if so, how did you first decide to do that then? At that time, there were plenty of job offers um, in corporate America. I could have very easily stayed in New York, but I just loved Japanese culture. I wanted to do something different. And it was just like, oh, like, why not? Like, let's just go do it. And I instead like packed my bags and moved to Japan to go teach English in the countryside. (laughs) How was that? And how long did you stay in Japan? I ended up staying for two and a half years. Wow. It was amazing. I would never trade that experience for anything else completely different as you can expect from say like (laughs) living in like New York or any other like major city I had never studied Japanese I looked Asian but I wasn't Japanese so it was like I fit in but not Mm -hmm. and that was a real kind of like left turn where I think like my parents and like many other people were all like oh like what is she doing (laughs) <laughs> and what did you feel you were doing then if you met Kim? Did you feel comfortable or did you feel pressured by society or your parents and people talking about that? I honestly um, didn't care uh, because <laughs> I was busy, you know, like having fun. And like mm-hmm. for the first time, like, yes, like this was maybe like not what I was going to do for forever, like teaching English in a foreign country. But 
I mean, I had like time to kind of like start to process like different things in my past or like have some kind of like peace and quiet and distance Mm -hmm. from what was what I perceived as kind of like a rat race in the U.S. That's key. And it kind of brings then to your chapter to Shanghai. How did you decide to move to China, leave Japan? Tell me a little bit more what happened in the decision making process. At the time, like, you know, a couple of years out of college, like, you know, I could have very easily also at that time returned to New York and like joined everyone in in what they were doing. But part of me kind of felt like a calling to actually go to China. After two and a half years, I had become relatively like proficient in Japanese just by studying on my own. Uh, or like, you know, with tutors. And so I was just like, well, if that's possible in like just two and a half years, like why can't I do that with Chinese was my thought. And so I moved there jobless. That's not easy. What happened after that once you were there? I would say that definitely like the first six months were really tough uh, because like, I mean, obviously, like, did not really know, like, what I was doing. Um, But luckily for me, like, you know, I did have family support. I lived with my aunt and uncle who had lived in Asia as expats for a very, very long time. He was, you know, like, nearing, like, the end of his career. I was just kind of beginning mine. So it was just, like, a great in-house, like, mentorship that I had when I first moved there. When I was in Japan, I actually really loved cooking and had started my own um, cooking blog um, because I lived in rural Japan. I met a lot of farmers and like knew about this whole like growing process. So actually like that became a tool for me to get my first job in China. And I was a marketing manager for a grocery delivery company. That is so cool. Um, And knowing Kim today, she does love to cook and is amazing uh, chef when she's behind the kitchen and integrating that. I didn't know the origin story of how it all began. Mm -hmm. Um, And even hence inspiring to hear how that helped you find your first gig in China. But you didn't stay there. You continued on to expand into different roles. Tell me a little bit more because I know there might be other listeners who's like, wait, I've always wanted to like work in Asia or like had the opportunity. And you really tapped in that circle because you ended up staying for quite some time in Shanghai and hence building a community and being a community leader there too. But tell me a little bit more of the other chapters as well and the other jobs. I definitely didn't know like how long of a chapter this would be. I ended up living in China for 11 years, by the way. It's an exhilarating place. It was an exhilarating time for me. It was so fast compared to um, life in the U.S., I think. It was amazing. I mean, I was young. I really just, like, tried to get, like, whatever opportunity I could. So, for example, you know, I liked animal welfare. So, you know, I was volunteering with a group. That later got me a job with a... Taiwanese vegetarian restaurant group because they also really cared about animal welfare. (laughs) They were looking for someone to help them do like business development, also grow it on a kind of international level. This restaurant group later did achieve their dream of becoming like a Michelin starred restaurant. That's really cool. But it was just like kind of like a right time, right place kind of thing. And also like, I really wanted it. At that time, like my mission was to bring healthy food to people and to like help educate them. And I actually ended up being part of like a major like health food boom back in the day in China. That is so cool. And I think for others who are tuning in, uh, I think the typical notion that I would think of how you get into restaurants because you that was like your industry. But I love that you tapped into it because of your passion and you found the connection on your own, which is a real hustle um, <laughs> and diligence and agility, which is a key skill of Kim. You give something to Kim and it will get 
it, it will it will happen things will come true and that's kind of her superpower and you didn't stop there you as you have hinted at the beginning you then went into interior design why did you then get into that space and what was it like well you know um interior design was kind of like a natural thing that happened um just mm. because after this vegetarian restaurant group i actually became ended up becoming a partner at a different Californian style healthy restaurant. And so before like I had just been doing like marketing and branding stuff afterwards like they were like, "Oh, like we want to actually just give you the opportunity to try to do these things even though like you've never done them." I'm very grateful to them forever by the way for that. I learned how to open an actual restaurant from pitching the concept to a mall to constructing it to opening it. That's amazing. Yeah. And I did it like seven times. Whoa. Yeah. That's when of course like I learned about like interior design and learned about materials. Like I was the person like going with the interior designer to like the chair supplier or to the fabric markets, like these kinds of things to like go sourcing. I mean, I loved it because I like the idea of how to actually package something together in a way that's then like received as like really comfortable and lively to someone else. And so that's how interior design uh, became an interest. But there was like one very significant time that kind of like pushed me even towards like a kind of like next step. This must have been at least like 6 years ago. We were building a completely like new restaurant concept, and it was the first time that we had actually gone to or my first time going to a design studio for branding. So people usually do go to branding agencies for this. Honestly, they did a really like really bad job. <laughs> like I don't know if you've ever like walked in anywhere or like gone through some experience that made you so angry that you were like, "Oh, like I could do this. I could do this myself." And like, you know, I still remember like when I got um the deck on restaurant uniforms, I was so angry at the poor quality of work that I was like, "I could do this myself." And so I actually spent the next two days putting a deck together under like some it was called like last minute productions or something I, i you know like i made up a name um so that my partners wouldn't know that it was me that did it and so i put i put all of the designs together for the restaurant uniform and then sent it to my partners wow <laughs> and the response i mean yeah they ended up picking one of them and that became like our uniform and so that was my first foray into fabric. <laughs> Amazing. And that I know leads you later into fashion. Tell me a little bit more about that transition as well. Yeah, that transition was um pretty like crazy, but also I'm sure people can relate to it if you've ever gone through like a really big any big change in life, honestly. The restaurants were exciting, like they were still expanding. but at the same time like something within me like had really shifted maybe like i was starting to like outgrow it whatever and it wasn't until like i actually had a conversation with one of my now former business partners where she asked me would you be happy like doing this 10 years like down the line wow i didn't tell her right at that moment but like the second she said that question i was like I got to get out. <laughs> All of these years like spent in like building this restaurant group, I was like coming to terms and a lot of it also kind of became like my identity in a way. Then I wanted to get out. I wanted to finally take a stab at like the art related stuff and like it was just it was time. That's incredible. I want to take a step back and kind of revisit this macro theme that you've shared which is the consistent courage to tap into a new space to open doors when you had no doors knocking on these different ways to finding that path 
but also knowing when you had to pivot. And then, I mean, that's multitude of different courage, which is like one, the courage to like get into these different places where it's hard. But two, after doing everything to build the expertise and kind of being on the lead, now realizing that, wait, maybe I want to leave. Like, that's not easy. As you say, that's like often like our job becomes our identity. And so I'm curious, like in, when we think of even both of those scenarios, like how do you find the courage to do all of that? Because I think that that's not really easy. Well, I would say that sometimes I maybe like don't think things all the way through before <laughs> I like doing them. That's part of it. Like, yes, it is courageous. And I'm sure it seems very courageous to people listening. But also like it's like a I'm more of a if I feel it like then I'll probably do it. Mm. And that's kind of like what led me towards that. I mean, it's not that I haven't gone through hard times after that. Like it's it's huge to suffer the loss of like an identity. I don't know, there's always like different phases and, and like seasons of life, you know? And not, not always like beautiful. <laughs> and I think this is part of the reason why as you started your chapter for your fashion as the founder and designer of Q Kimber, there's a very unique intersection, but also very powerful start and growth. I think than a traditional designer might have gone through. Now, again, like I'm still learning more about the fashion space. You're more of the veteran. But would you say like, I'm curious, like how your past unique experience, maybe atypical fashion designer experience helped you become a fashion designer more in a unique and different way? Because like, yes, like I could call my, I call myself fashion designer now, but I don't have any of the kind of like traditional training so for me to kind of like compare to that like i can't really just like like i think like sometimes like they other fashion designers may not like really understand like what i'm doing either <laughs> i kind of like really like did it scared and like i did it out of passion before that like you know when i was doing like the restaurants and starting to feel like some kind of disconnect I actually picked up painting as a hobby because I wanted to learn about color composition, if fashion or art was really like a direction that I was going to go into. And then I ended up actually becoming like obsessed, like all of my uh, whatever other free hours, like I canceled dinner with friends, like I was painting like crazy. My painting teachers, yeah, they got to know me and then they were like, oh, um, do you think like we can uh, represent you? And then at that time I was like, yeah, sure. It was a verbal conversation. And honestly, I forgot about it because yeah. to me, it's yeah. kind of like if there's no contract signed, like it's not, you know, but uh, well, I forgot. While I had already left like the restaurant group and trying to like figure out like what am I as like a new identity. They actually messaged me saying that they had gotten an opportunity for me wow. um, at a mall. And I was like, excuse me, like what? And apparently like they had believed in me so much that they put together a 50 page deck about me as an artist wow. with all of my paintings with like interactive art exhibitions and like sent this off to a commercial developer. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, it was amazing and it was crazy. Like I remember looking at the first time I looked at that file, I was like, this is, this is not real. <laughs> we ended up like it didn't get approved at the very end, but then I was like, well, I mean like, these people without knowing me that long did this for me and for themselves of course but like they did this for me and i was like well why can't i just do that for myself and so that's how i ended up pitching like my fashion brand and got like a pop-up in in an actual like commercial space like first floor of a mall that's amazing. Oh, yeah. thank you so much for sharing that. And I'm <laughs> curious where the name is inspired from. Oh, um, honestly, it was a random name that like a friend gave me 
in like 2007 or something. Yeah, because I had always been tinkering around with like jewelry and other things. Like I've actually owned, had this brand since like 2007. Whoa. So it's definitely the the folks who are tuning in. If you have been a longtime fan, you are in for a real treat <laughs> diving into these uh, stories and we're building on what helped you be who you are. Um, fast forward now, you started doing full times. You, you continue to do it in Shanghai, but you decided to still come back to the States. Why do you decide to come back to the States? I think that the U.S. is a completely like different market that like I didn't know. And on top of that, my um, designs are relatively colorful. So these brands actually usually do a lot better in the U.S. And on top of that, like just life wise, like I wanted to come back to the U.S. and to my family and friends. Finally, this was kind of like my way to to try to get back like with my own project. And I know for those who do get a chance to see us on video, they're getting a little bit of hint. Can you show a little bit of the items so that we can admire? So she is wearing an outfit with her print and you have a painting of that print as well. (gasps) Look how gorgeous that is. How long does a painting like that take for you? You know, sometimes they're really fast. Sometimes they're really slow. It depends on how much like in the flow you are. Mm Mm-hmm. But this one actually was like the very first painting where I was like, oh, I think like it'll become fabric. And like, I still remember I was painting this like my painting teacher like stayed up with me until like midnight or 1 a.m. Like when I was painting in the studio. That's incredible. And then you have earrings, I believe, as well. How do you decide on those design? These ones I originally made in, I think, like 2009 or 2010 when I was playing around and like living in Japan. So cool. Um, And I know for those who get to follow her and as a fan and tuning into this, Kim has been very busy. She's been uh, present in many shows. Uh, and in the marketplace and in the States. And so I'm curious, like from just a fashion designer perspective, like what, um, I guess one, like, how do you manage your time and energy? Because it feels like you have to almost be like everywhere, but like you also need time offline to create, to work on your business as well and have time to generate new ideas. Like, I'm curious how that works for you. Well, I'd have to say when I first came back, it kind of didn't because it was very shocking to like be back in the U.S. and the cultures are very different. And I was like moving back with family, like all of it is just like, it was a lot. I wish actually in the first year I had given myself a lot more time off instead of just like diving ahead and doing like so many events. They are tiring. Yes, like that is like where you learn about like what products work and do not. But at the same time, There's also like, you have to like give yourself time to rest. And I actually happen to be in a period of that right now. How do you balance that out? Do you allocate a specific time? Do you have hobbies to make sure you rest? And I I assume also as a creative, it's important to have time to create. So how do you balance all of that? Right now, Oh, wait, I also have to do have to mention that like I do um, some consulting work too. Uh, in the US. So it's like the consulting projects are, you know, like two to three months. For example, this last one, um, I helped a fashion tech startup called Pickle open their first um, boutique in the West Village. Um, That was, it was was a great experience, by the way, and shout out to Pickle, you should check them out. It was, you know, like two to three months of really intense, like, you know, on a deadline to open a shop with a pretty, you know, kind of like green team that had never, never opened one. For me, like that was just like the perfect kind of thing where I can help people kind of like realize like their own dreams. Um, These are skill sets that I've just picked up like over the years. Having that and then being able to take a break in between that to then 
actually be like very mindful of when I'm being creative, when I rest, and to actually like enjoy that time instead of worrying about what the next thing is. Mm, no, thank you for sharing that. And um, it, it's so inspiring. I mean, like um, I, I mentioned in the intro for the listeners who've probably heard of how the journey of how I met Kim, but uh, I mean, I was so blown away even from the beginning when I was first introduced to her through a friend of a friend and more importantly, just the humility and joy she purely has in navigating all these different spaces as you're hearing. And one of the things, Kim, that I, I love uh, that you've highlighted is just like humanizing all of this. It's not that it's picture perfect. It's like you go through one at a time. I'm curious, like if we get a tip and insight into where your future is going to look like, given all the different chapters or there. Are there new chapters that you're hoping to add in your business line and experience? Or is it still like, ask me maybe a few years later type of thing? <laughs> Honestly, I would be pretty content at least for the next few years to do something very similar to what I'm doing now. Like, for example, you know, pick up like three to four kind of like consulting gigs on helping people actually like really open up and, and operate like their businesses. And then the second part would be, you know, like especially with the fashion and like actually creating, like I'd have to say that that one is like significantly, at least to me, like more challenging work versus like the things that like are also challenging, but like I've done them so many times, so it's just relatively like easier. And so it's understanding like that the thing that's like a lot harder is going to take a longer time. Mm, no, appreciate you sharing that. Uh, and it'll be remiss if we don't get to emphasize and talk about some of the themes of this month, Asian American Pacific Island Heritage Month for API History. For you being Asian American, how has your identity influenced you also in all these chapters and who you are as an innovator? I mean, all the way from like starting from like growing up, I always felt like I was like really just in between like lots of things. And so for me to like go from like, you know, the US to Japan to China, all of it was always, I was just like, well, I'm just an outsider, like whatever. I guess this means like I'm still going to do like whatever I want to do. <laughs> That's kind of like what I perceive it to be. I'm strongly rooted in say like having like collective values and like, you know, also growing like community, whether that was through say like work in food or even like creating like a APAHM, which I did when I was in China. And so it's more of just like kind of seeing like the opportunity for where like more people can connect. Love that. Love that. I appreciate you bridged. Uh, you know, for some that might have felt like the barrier, you translated that in the very opportunity of the in-between experiences into being hence the bridge building skills. Um, and uh, she didn't get to highlight much, but on top of all of this, she's very active community builder and has fostered in all the different groups as she continue to live in different chapters. And so grateful for your wisdom, leadership, but also just advocacy and connecting those different dots. Uh, we covered a lot of different grounds. We want to continue our learning. One of the big thing that of why I'm doing this theme structure for this season three is that we want to continue to expand our learning of other innovators. We're excited that we can learn from you today, but could you shout out three other innovators who happen to be Asian American that you think we should learn from and how they inspired you in your journey too? Well, one would be like our friend in common, Ken, um, Ken Chung. Um, he, I think he's like Hong Kongese, but th the kind of like, I don't know, like who is able to say that they've had like three exits as like COO of companies and also like just knowing him personally and seeing like what kind of growth like he's gone through as a person has been truly like amazing. Another woman that I can think of. Um, her name's Elle. Met her because I was sitting next to her at a TED Talk many, many years ago. 
And I think like she, she's Thai. And then at that time she was just like, yeah, I got hired at this company. And I told them like, I needed three months to be able to work in Chinese. And I was like, like they're like, that's pretty crazy. Um, but she did it. She's excellent. And then she built her own, um, clean beauty brand in Thailand that is like breaking barriers right now. Yeah. Who are some other Asian Americans that you have in mind? Two women that I actually even count as mentors. Um, one is Peggy Liu. She is a time like a hero of the environment. And I worked with her a lot through healthy food initiatives. She has also gone through like a lot of amazing growth both personally and professionally. And I think that she's currently working with like the nation of Hawaii. Wow. Yeah. And then the second one um, is uh, another mentor to me, my former business partner um, named Kelly Lee, who was a very, very well-known restaurateur in Shanghai and Beijing. Folks, again, check out our blog. Um, can't believe how fast time has gone by as we continue our conversation. Two final questions I have for you, Kim, is one, you shared so many wisdom and perspective. What is the final word of wisdom that you want to share with our listeners to empower them no matter the, where they are in their journey as an innovator? Try and look at things as if like they're really all like phases, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. Like, things are will always change and so like especially I guess like if you're feeling stuck like you won't always be stuck powerful reminders thank you for that and last but not least what is the best way folks can stay in touch with you let me see. Um, I guess it would just be through signing up for my email newsletter for my fashion brand um, which is uh, on my website www.qkimber.com and she is very active also on Instagram and LinkedIn. So do check out. Uh, we'll make sure we have the links. But with that being said, thank you so much for sharing your story. Wishing you continued success and growth. And for folks, we'll tune into another story next week. So thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Monica. Thank you, Kim. Bye. Well, I'm personally happy she's back in the States as well. Uh, we met through a mutual friend while she was still in Shanghai during the pandemic. So we started to hang out and had virtual calls and build our friendship. But, you know, it's still really nice to see her in person, which uh, we've got a chance to do a lot, both in New York and D.C. And it's really cool to see how she has intertwined all her different skills, business opening, startup, marketing, restaurant business, interior design. And this is probably the reason why even with her success partnering with organizations like Pickle and other and startups have been a unique strength of hers in addition to being a designer. So what are you waiting for? As she has says, start what you love and dive right into it. I hope this conversation has inspired you and reminded you no matter where you are, your voice and stories matter. Thanks again for the past few weeks tuning into stories with us on Asian American Leaders as we celebrate AAPI Heritage Month in May. Uh, next month, we are going to dive into now celebration of Pride Month. Yes, it's June coming up soon. So join us as we continue to learn innovators in their inspiring journeys and who happen to be from LGBTQ. See you next week. Have a wonderful day today. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode at Curious Monica. I'm your host and executive director of the show, Monica King, founder and CEO of Innovators Box. And a little love shout out to our team who made this show possible for you today from Innovators Box Studios. Audio engineering and producing, Sam Weimer. Audio engineering assistance, Ravi Ladd. Website and marketing support, Cree Panday. Graphic support, Leah Orsini. Christine Eribal. Original music by Innovators Box Studios. 
and executive producing, writing and editing and interviewing and all that jazz by me, Monica King. I hope you enjoyed today's conversation. Please send us a note for any feedback and suggestions and questions that you have at info at innovatorsbox.com. Have a wonderful day and see you soon.